Hey, welcome to episode 15 of Bloggers Are Weird. I am your host, DJ Paris, from the blog ThoughtsFromParis.com, also featured on AimingLow.com. And where else am I featured? That's it. That's all I got. But, oh, and I have a book. Uh, By the way, I have a book, Holy Crap, I'm Bathing in a Rose, available now on Amazon.com. It's the best of thoughts from Paris 2012. It's three bucks. Go buy it. You're worth it. I'm worth it. Anyway, I've been going back and listening to some old episodes of the show, and I found that most of my intros are, hey, welcome to episode three of Bloggers Are Weird. And I have that sort of low-energy NPR-style voice, which is a little non-engaging. So I'm going to try to emote more appropriately because I am excited about doing the show. It's a lot of fun for me, but I promise also not to overdo it with the um, tonality because there's nothing worse than when you're really bummed out than having to pretend to get excited. So you might hear one of these days a, you know, episode 27 and I have crippling depression. I made it out of bed, but only to go to the bathroom and so if, if, I, if that happens, and hey, life's a cycle, right? It does. I promise to be true to that particular uh, emotion and emote appropriately with my voice. But anyway, I'm pretty excited today. Although it is Easter and I'm sort of worn out from all the food I've eaten and ham. And oh, I want to say something about ham now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, honey-baked ham, the actual honey-baked ham, if you've never had it, it's the greatest thing just about on the planet, meat-wise, right? There's gyro meat, which is right up there, and then there's honey-baked ham. I think it trumps filet. Uh, I think it trumps tri-tip. I think it trumps, you know, a leg of lamb. You know, anything that, that you put right near at the top, I think uh, honey-baked ham trumps it all. And so I've been eating a lot of that. I'm sweating ham at this point, and I brought home like half of it from my parents' house, and I'm going to be eating ham for the next few days. Oh, that reminds me, first of all, before I get into what that reminds me, I'm why am I excited about today's show? Because I have one of my absolute favorite humorists on the show today. Her name's Tracy Beckerman. If you aren't familiar with her, you should be. She's probably in your newspaper. She is in over 400 newspapers across the country with her column, Lost in Suburbia. And she's a personal friend. We've both spoken at conferences together, or a conference, and we'll be speaking again at another conference together. She also uh, found out she speaks at the Irma Bombeck Humor Bombeck Humor Bombeck Humor Conference. She's great. Tracy Beckerman, a friend, and really funny, and definitely can put me in my place. And she's got a new book out, Lost in Suburbia, and this is being published. It's going to be in, it's already published. It's going to be available in a couple of days on the 2nd of April. So I will have a click-through link in my blog. You can purchase it, but we have a contest and here's the contest. You can win. I have a copy of her book. I haven't thumbed through it. It's totally uh, still sealed, but I have a paperback version of her book and I'm giving it away. So here are the rules. It's very simple. All you have to do If you're listening to this, by the way, um, via iTunes or um, a particular podcast app on your Android phone, all you have to do is visit my website, thoughtsfromparis.com, look for the post about this particular uh, podcast um, episode, and there's going to be a little link right inside of the post which says enter your email address. This is a daily email I send out. I don't send it out every day, so don't worry. And it's just if I post a story, you get it emailed to you the next day. That way you don't have to visit my website as much. Although you should visit my website because I do have advertisers and they expect to get traffic. But just in case you know you forget to check my website, I'll email you my story every single day. You can unsubscribe if you don't like it. But this way you can be put in for the the giveaway of Tracy's book. I'm going to be giving it away on the second, on the day her book goes live. Also, you can pre-order it on Amazon. Again, I'll have a link right on my website. So all you have to do is click and enter your email address, subscribe. But there's one more step. Uh, You're going to receive a validation email that says, hey, just to confirm that you really did sign up for this, you click a button to confirm, and then you've probably done that before. And you're going to opt in to my news, my little daily email. 
And I promise not to spam you or, or try to sell you things or anything like that. Other than my book. I'll try to sell you my book. But other than that, uh, it's really simple and easy. And I'll just take who, all the people that have subscribed. Even if you're an existing subscriber, don't worry. You're included. And I will draw the winner on Tuesday and mail out the book to you, courtesy of Tracy Beckerman. Thank you very much, by the way, to her for giving me a copy to give away to you guys. Okay. I want to talk about one last thing. Speaking of ham, this is what reminded me earlier. I am on a weight loss challenge which I've never had to be in my past. I've always been a pretty appropriately sized person. I have had the gift of a fast metabolism, and I'm tall, so I get away with it. When I gain weight, which I haven't done up until about two years ago, I started to slowly gain weight as my metabolism appears to be uh, winding down, and I gain weight all over my body at about the same proportion. So I don't ever look fat. But I normally weigh, just so that give you some perspective, I'm about just under 6'3". <laughs> Why don't I just say 6'2"? I, don't you hate when people do that? It's so, oh, it's such an ego thing. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little above 6'2". I'm closer to 6'3". Anyway, I'm 6'2", about 6'2 and a half or so. Anyway, whatever. So I'm 6'2". I really should be, ideally, at about 195 pounds. That would sort of be my ideal, and I'd have to... You know, if I could have like a 15% body fat or 12% body fat, that would really be me at my best. Well, I don't even know my body fat percentage. It would be too depressing to to even say and or to look. Uh, I have these calipers and they pinch your your fat on the side of your body. I also have one of those scales that tells you, but it's not as accurate. So I literally bought these calipers and you want to talk depressing, pinch the side of your stomach to the side, right? And pinch that and take some calipers and do the readout and you will just, there's no way you'll feel good about yourself. Anyway, um, so I am at about 227 pounds, my absolute fattest in my entire life. Now, I, just to give you some perspective, up until about two years ago, I never even crossed 200 pounds. So I've legitimately put this on and this is how fat I am. You'd look at me and you wouldn't think it because I gain it all about at the same proportion. But a woman the other day came up to me and said, boy, look at how strong you're getting. Your arms are huge. No, I, I haven't been exercising my arms. That's just fat. So I am literally look like I've put on muscle mass. The sad part is if you looked at my stomach, you would see that I have now a little tiny bit of a, a stomach. So I, my father today at, at, at brunch when we were eating some ham, he said, I've got a challenge for you because my parents said, how much do you weigh? Are you like over 200 pounds? And when I told them, they were pretty shocked and they said, all right, you need to do something about that. And they're right. So here's what I'm going to do. I have 10 weeks. My father said, I will give you 10 weeks to lose 20 pounds. That's two pounds a week. And, you know, most diet professionals, nutrition experts say that that's, that's appropriate. Two pounds a week is doable. And if you can do that for your birthday dinner, which is June 10th, in case you're saving up for me, I will buy your birthday dinner. Now they always buy my birthday dinner. So that's not much of much of a gift. I mean, it's a great gift, but I'm sort of used to that. But that's fair enough because hey, I mean, losing 20 pounds is a is a gift into uh, or is a reward unto itself. So this this so I said, well, what happens if I lose? And we thought about it, and I said it has to be painful, or I'm not gonna. It's not gonna matter to me. And that my dad said, okay, well then you can pay for your dinner, <laughs> and all of our dinners. So there's four of us. We figure that's going to be about a $300 dinner because I'm go we're going to a really nice place. And I just can't afford $300 dinners, right? So I have to make this work. And even though this blog and this podcast are all about me, I'm going to sweeten the pot. Once I get to 20 pounds lost, and I will, and I will do it probably, I've done that in like three weeks before. And it was, it was not because I was, you know, hopped up on amphetamines. Or was I? No, I wasn't. But I will get to it, and I will get to it before 10 weeks. Anyway, I'm going to give away 20 copies of my book for the 20 pounds I've lost, but only to my daily email subscribers, okay? So just like for Tracy's entry for the giveaway, the same entry applies for my giveaway. So I don't have thousands of subscribers, mind you. So you have a good chance of actually winning one of my books. So just to recap, go to my website, thoughtsfromparis.com. Enter in your email address. Confirm the email that comes back to you. And you are now entered in two giveaways. One for Tracy Beckerman's book, which will be launched on the 2nd of April, as well as my weight loss 
a 20 copy book giveaway, which hopefully will be done in the next 10 weeks or so. So I want you to grab some Peeps or whatever your Easter drug of choice is. Mine are the Cadbury cream eggs, but not those gross orange ones. I can't believe people buy those and eat those. Those are nasty, but the regular ones are delicious. And the caramel ones, the best. Anyway, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Today's podcast is sponsored by romance-text.com. Looking to reignite the passion in your relationship? You have to check out romance-text.com. This is how to use text messages to bring back the passion and reignite the spark you once had. Now, if you're thinking this sounds cheesy or maybe it's just learning how to send dirty text messages, it's actually not. This program by relationship expert Michael Fiore has been featured in over 200 television and radio shows. This program has a money-back guarantee. is normally $97, but listeners of Bloggers Are Weird get a special price of only $47 for the entire program. By purchasing the program, you help support this show. Visit romance-text.com and get the passion back. Um, how's your dog? He's, I, I feel bad for him. I gave him a tough time today. You know, he's only six months. House training thing is still a little bit of a mystery to him. I mean, he's mostly pretty good at it, but he doesn't quite get the fact that he needs to ask to go out. So oh, right. if we wait too long, then he'll pee on the floor. And we're, we're waiting for him to make the connection between feeling the urge and like barking or, you know, scratching at the door or something, anything, right? You know what you can do is you can get like a little um, something. Like I have some bells that yeah, I tried to teach my dog. He tried that and he, he stole the bells and ran into the other room with them. He, <laughs> he just doesn't seem to like get that when he feels that urge, he's supposed to go outside. You know, like when I take him outside I, and I say go potty, he goes. But um, he's just, he hasn't quite, there's that one last connection he hasn't made. So today I took him out and um he, you know, he did his business. I brought him back inside. I left him downstairs. I came upstairs to take a shower. And I went down to check on him, and there was a puddle in the kitchen. I was like, oh. Oh. So I was really frustrated. It had been less than, it was like half an hour, you know? Right. So I clean up the puddle, and then I'm like, all right, well, I guess you're cleaned out now. I went back upstairs to finish getting ready. I come down again. There's another puddle on the floor in the same place right in front of the refrigerator. And I'm like, man, Monty, come on. What, you know? And I'm giving him a really hard time. And I was like, all right, you know, just this is ridiculous. And I took him outside. He didn't go because, you know, he just peed on the floor. Um, and then I was like, all right, well, let me, let me give you your lunch, and, you know, then I'll finish getting ready. So I gave him his lunch. I walked back into the room, and there's another puddle on the floor. I'm like, how the heck did he make a puddle on the floor when he's in the other room eating his lunch? And <laughs> I realized that it wasn't the dog who was peeing on the floor. The refrigerator was leaking. <laughs> and then I felt really bad because I'd been so mean to him. And I went over to him. I gave him this big hug. I'm like, Monty, I'm so sorry. And then he peed on the floor. <laughs> Did he, uh, that's a great story. <laughs> and that's pretty typical the way things go around here. I think it's because I have a water curse right now. You, I'm sorry, you have what? I have a water curse. What's that? Um. Well, we... Uh, about two weeks ago, my husband woke up and he said that our one of the, one of the spigots outside was leaking, and um, we'd had some trouble with this particular faucet in the past. And you know, this is one of the, the fun things about being a homeowner. So he said, you know, call the plumber over here and tighten it up before everything freezes. So I called the plumber. Plumber's like, I, I you know, it's not an emergency. I can't be there for like five hours. I'm like, all right, that's fine. So. Five hours come and go, and the guy shows up, and he goes down to the basement to find the shutoff valve, and he yells, Tracy! I go running downstairs, and, like, my, my basement is floating. I mean, there's just oh. bunches, bunches of inches of water down there. I'm like, oh, my God. And apparently, it wasn't the spigot that was broken. It was the pipe that fed the spigot, which broke inside the wall and flooded the basement. Oh. So it was, it was a nightmare, and, um, you know... He finally found a shutoff valve, which incidentally was like um, sealed behind a wall where like the last homeowner had like added an addition onto the house. <laughs> so he like bust the wall down to get to the pipe. And um, then we had to bring in a crew to kind of like suck all the water out of the basement. And the sound of the hoses going freaked the dog out so much that he peed all over the downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least there was water there. Oh, there was so much water. Um, Is it? 
is it carpeted or it's no? It's carpeted, yeah. Uh, did did you did you have to replace all the carpeting? No, it took them about a week, but they dried everything out, and then we had the crew come in and like you know clean it with this mold stuff and everything. And it looks like they salvaged everything. Um, but then, um, like, less than a week later, we had, like, another pipe that broke in one of the bathrooms. And now we have this thing with the dog peeing everywhere. And I'm convinced it's like a water curse. I think I, like, pissed off some gypsy or something. And she must have cursed me, you know, that I would have all these water issues. <laughs> That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Oh, by the way, talking to Tracy Beckerman. Uh, nationally syndicated columnist and also blogger as well as author. She has a new book coming out, Lost in Suburbia, which is what, April 13th? Is that right? April 2nd. April 2nd. I was way off. Um, and this is book number two. It is. The first one I self-published. The second one, they actually thought and you know enough of me to give me a traditional book deal, which was very nice. Um, well, I, I just thought it was funny that I – you have a team now that I went through your team, and in fact, I just said, can I just contact her directly? And they said, no, <laughs> you, come, you come through the team, and, and that was pretty cool. That's, that's uh, actually all I pay them to do is just tell people no, that they have to go through them, so it makes me seem more important than I actually am. Oh. Well, and that, co- that, actually, that, that costs a lot of money. By the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, do, do you have something to read for us today? I do. I'm going to read a chapter. From my new book, Lost in Suburbia, a memoir, how I got pregnant, lost myself, and got my cool back in the New Jersey suburbs, as though you couldn't already tell I was from New Jersey. <laughs> well, it's yours. Go ahead. All right. Hang on a second. Because I just missed the page. All right, here we go. To reflect on what it is to be cool and how to get your cool back once you've lost it, it helps to figure out what might have caused you to stop being cool in the first place. For me, it was that little thing called pregnancy. Had I known that pregnancy was going to so completely undermine all the hard work I had put into my coolness, I might have ordered a baby from a catalog instead and called it a day. Of course, there are things about being pregnant that are cool, like seeing the first sonogram where your baby looks like an alien monkey and feeling the baby kick and pretending that Krispy Kreme donuts are good for you and the baby. But it's definitely hard to look cool when you're so big you should have your own zip code. When I was pregnant, it was impossible to hide all that bigness with cute maternity clothes. This was before Liz Lang designed maternity clothes. This was before even Old Navy had a maternity department. When I was pregnant, I think all maternity clothes were made by granimals. All the tops matched the pants, and everything was in big, bold prints, and it looked like it had been designed by an 80-year-old woman named Gertrude who lived in Century Village. There was no black. There were no jeans. There was certainly no leather. Just polyester. Lots and lots of polyester. The good news is pregnancy does come to an end eventually. The bad news, however, is that being pregnant and uncool almost always segues into being a new mom and uncool. It's funny how walking around for a year with spit-up drool, partially digested mashed bananas, and all other forms of baby regurgitation on your clothing will make you very, very uncool. Needless to say, I was cool with the other moms. Those mashed bananas are like a merit badge of honor. It's the ultimate sign of solidarity in the sorority of motherhood. Unfortunately, it just didn't go with my DKNY tops. Of course, I didn't know any of this the day I peed on a stick and I saw a big plus sign telling me I was pregnant. I remember sitting my husband down on the teensy tiny kitchen table in the all-in-one living room, dining room, kitchen bedroom of our teeny tiny apartment in New York City. Then I plunked a jar of spaghetti sauce in front of him. What's this, he asked. I grinned like the proverbial Cheshire cat. What's it say? Prego. Well, I smiled knowingly. We are having pasta for dinner, he guessed. Try again, I coaxed. Chicken parm, he wondered. Ah! It's not about food, I glared at him and wondered whether it was the Y chromosome or the ability to grow facial hair that makes men so dense. What does it say, I repeated. Prego, he repeated. He looked at me with exasperation and then shrugged. I got nothing. Prego, I said. Prego. He shook his head. I'm pregnant, I shouted. Really? Yes, I beamed. Cool, he grinned. But what does that have to do with spaghetti sauce? <laughs> I uh, I actually read that part of the book, but it's so much. Are you doing an audio version? Because that was so much more enjoyable than just reading. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask my team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you should for sure do that. That is a no brainer for you because it's so it's so nice to hear your voice with your written voice. Oh, cool. Thank you. 
Um, so, so speaking, you talked about about previously being cool. I read also in your book about how you actually used to have a pretty cool life prior to being a mom. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, I did. It was it was it was a pretty cool life actually. I mean, you know, definitely cool on paper. You know, whether it's actually cool in, in actuality, I'm not sure. But um, you know, I was a single city chick living in New York, and I had a really awesome job working in television. And you know, that sounds really good, except when you break it down and you look at it. The sad fact was I made very little money. I lived in a um, studio apartment with lots of cockroaches, and I had a shop for all my cool clothes at sample sales where I would, like, strip naked in the middle of a hundred other, like, screaming women, um, you know, and, and these days I'm terrified that my kids will find, like, you know, secret hidden video of me on the Internet, like, running around in my bra and underwear and trying on clothes at sample sales. Um, but, you know, there, there's a certain glamour to being impoverished and working in television and living with cockroaches. And uh, and I thought it was all pretty cool. And I had a pretty cool haircut, too. But then um, I got pregnant, and I had my son, and I had always thought I would go back to my job. And all of a sudden, it just kind of lost all of its appeal for me. And I really felt like I was missing something by not being home with him. So at first, I started trying to freelance, and then ultimately, I said, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not going to do this anymore. And my husband and I agreed that I would stay home with my son but um, when we went from two incomes to one income, we just couldn't afford to stay in the city anymore. So we decided to move to the I'm sorry, I have trouble saying that word. <laughs> we decided to move to the suburbs of New Jersey, and um, and it was all downhill from there. I mean, there's actually nothing wrong with New Jersey or the suburbs. It was just a, just a major major adjustment for me, and I was not doing very well at um, making that adjustment. Um, I, I just, I kind of never got into the losing weight post-pregnancy thing. I kind of figured, well, I'm going to have another one anyway, so why bother working that hard to lose all the weight um, without thinking about how much more difficult it was going to be after the second one was born. Um, and I let my hair grow out, and then I had, like, this really awful mom bob, and I started wearing mom jeans and driving a mom car, and it was just so uncool, <laughs> you know? Um, and I was having a lot of trouble connecting with the other moms. Um, you know, I was looking, I think, to have really interesting conversations, and everybody just talked about how tired they were and what new cleaning products they discovered, and I just didn't know what I was doing wrong. Um, and it, it took a lot to kind of uncover what I needed to get my groove back. And that's what the, the book is really about. It's about that whole journey of losing my cool and then getting it back. And um, I wrote it because uh, I really felt like it was something a lot of women could relate to. Um, when I would do book signings for my first book, which was called um, Rebel Without a Minivan, women would come up to me at my book signings and they would say, I'm a rebel too. They would like whisper this in my ear and I'd look at them and they'd be wearing all pink and green. You know, and <laughs> they'd be in their little tennis outfits and, and you know, they'd have their minivans parked outside. And I'm like, yeah, sure you are. But I realized that, you know, regardless of what we look like on the outside, I think internally a lot of women do have, like, this big identity shift when they become moms, especially if you had a job and you quit it to be, to be home with your kids. And you feel really good about being home with your kids, and yet you definitely feel this great sense of loss for what you had before. Um, and then there's really a tough balance to strike at that point. How, cause how long have you had your blog? Um, I did the blog – uh, I had done, I've been writing the column for about seven years, I think. And then somebody suggested to me that I start doing a blog because I was only writing the column once a week. And they said, Oh, if you did a blog, then we could read you more than, you know, just that once a week. And I also recognized that there was sort of this, you know, huge increase in the number of mommy bloggers who were out there. And I felt like it would be a good place for me to kind of join in the fray, you know, with my humorous stories. And my blog, I think, is less sort of, um, you know, a lot of mom blogs, I think, uh, do a lot of talking about what life is like in their home and what it's like for them. Um, it's, you know, the more serious tone. And I think I just tend to tell a lot of humorous anecdotes in my blog. Um, and then you see so you were doing the column. How did you get the column? How did you start the column? Um, the column was actually – part of what helped me kind of get my groove back. Um, my son was five and my daughter was three. And so they were both in school. He was in school half a day. She was in school like three days a week. And I started to have some time to myself to actually consider doing something 
other than laundry and food shopping. And um, I really wanted to do something creative, but I didn't want to go back to work full time. I certainly didn't want to commute into the city. And um, I had been a writer in the TV industry. And my son came home one day from kindergarten, and this funny thing had happened around Valentine's Day and the Valentine's cards the kids gave, gave each other. And I just decided to write about it. So I wrote this story about this Valentine's Day incident, and I sent it into my local newspaper, and they ran it. And then they called me, and they said, do you have any more? And I'm like, more what? You know, I didn't, it didn't <laughs> connect for me that they wanted me to write more columns for them. And um, they really liked what I'd written, so I sent something else, and they ran that. And then they gave me um, – I, I sort of filled the vacation slot. There was another woman who was writing for them like three weeks out of every month, so I got the, the fourth week. And But I got it regularly, like, you know, every fourth week, and then it became every second week, and then it became every week. Um, and I said to my husband, I'm like, look, I have a job. I'm making $10 a week. We can retire. <laughs> um, what was really fortunate is that the, the newspaper that was carrying me was part of a larger newspaper group. And some of the other newspapers took notice of my column and asked if they could start carrying it, too. So I'm like, yay, I'm syndicated. Um, but I realized that, you know, if even though it was just like three newspapers, if three newspapers thought that it was worthwhile enough to start carrying it, maybe there were other newspapers that would carry it, too. So I just sat down one day and sent out like a whole mess of emails to all these other newspaper groups I had found and asked if they'd be interested in running my column. And one group of 50 newspapers came back right away and said that they were interested. And um, it just kind of grew from there. And all of a sudden, I had this new career. How, how many uh, newspapers are you currently? Now, I'm in over 400 newspapers in 25 states, and it reaches um, a circulation of about 10 million people. Wow. So, you know, once, once I got that going, it was a lot easier to get a traditional publishing deal. Um, they said, what's your book about? You know, I said, do you want to know what my book is about? They said, no, you have 10 million people who read your column. You can have a book deal. <laughs> you could write, you could write about killing gypsies exactly. and, uh, <laughs> it would still sell. Yes. I would never kill oh. gypsies though. <laughs> no. I would just ask them oh. to take their water curse back. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. So, um, so tell, tell me more about now. Did you, did you grow up in New Jersey or somewhere else? I did not. I am not an original Jersey girl. I know that I give that appearance, and I sound that way. Um, not too far away. I grew up in Westchester uh, County, which is um, county uh, suburbs of New York. So I grew up in a town called New Rochelle, which some people may remember as the place where Rob and Laura Petrie from the Dick Van Dyke Show live. Um, but I could be really dating myself here now. But it's about no, it's a, it's a, it's a timely reference. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, do you know he just? I think he just had a baby, Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, he did. He's like, That's right. He's like 87, isn't he? Yes. Man, good luck with that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a smart play. Yeah, I hope he gets a lot of nannies. Um, <laughs> no, wait, I know. He's 67, but he's. I was realizing that he was going to be like 87 when his – maybe he is 87. I'm not sure. Okay, but I digress. Um, so I grew up in New Rochelle, and my husband actually grew up in New Jersey. And when we were trying to figure out – which suburb we should move to because, you know, you always have to move close to one of your parents so they can help you out with the babysitting. Um, he said to me, uh, if we move to New Jersey, my parents will help out with the kids. And if we move to um, Westchester, you're going to have to pick up your dad's dry cleaning. So <laughs> when he put it that way, you know, I, I opted for the lesser of two evils. I figured, you know, I'm going to have enough raising two children without having to get my dad's dry cleaning. So we'll go to New Jersey. And um, I moved out here and I just, kind of immediately did not fit in because I went to the mall and there were all <laughs> these girls there with big hair and I had very short hair <laughs> and they looked at me like I was an alien um, and I didn't drive a minivan and they couldn't understand why I wasn't driving a minivan um, but I, I have since made my peace with the New Jersey ladies and you know they kind of accept my short hair and my lack of minivanness and you know I accept all of their little idiosyncrasies, and, and we have found our way with each other. Yeah, I spent about about a month or so out at the, at the shore back in like 2001, and I had never seen anything like it. And it, it, I think I was in Tom's River or somewhere around there, and I, I just couldn't believe the hair and the women in particular, the nails, all the black. I mean, it was it was just marvelous. I'd never seen anything quite quite the same anywhere else, and I traveled the country at the time. It's not like Peoria, is it? No, 
No, but we should say Tra- Tracy got her bought her dog from um, some a breeder in my hometown, which is just a random coincidence. In Peoria. In Peoria. Yeah. Also, we spent uh, a weekend together, not not a romantic weekend, but we spent uh, at uh, the Aiming Low Noncon uh, in Georgia. That was fabulous. It was great to meet you then. Now I did, yeah. and I neglected to tell you that when I flew to Peoria, the um, you know which has this this one airplane. Um, area, um, what do you call it? Terminal, one terminal. Thank you. Yeah, and, that's about and, it. And um, I was dismayed because my my flight, my depart departing flight, was a little bit delayed. And the woman at the gate said that you know I should be relieved. It's only about ten minutes delayed. That um, the flight the day before, the same time the day before, had been delayed over an hour and a half because there was a cow on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the Puria Airport is in. One of the most rural, I mean, it's not even Peoria, really. It's just this remote rural area. So, yeah. And then you only went like a mile from there. Yes, I know. But I thought that was very amusing because, you know, at Newark Airport, we generally don't get cows on the runway, you know. I mean, (laughs) occasionally we'll get like a tiger that escaped from somebody's apartment. That's right. But, uh, you know, that's about as wild as it gets. (laughs) (laughs) So are you, gonna, are you going on some sort of book tour where you're going to be reading and signing and doing all of that? I'm going to have to check with my team on that. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I am. We are in the process of planning some events. We're hoping to hit about six cities. I'm also doing a blog tour, um, which will be in many more cities than that, um, and that will run all through the month of April. But we're hoping to go to Boston, Chicago, Washington, D.C., um, Atlanta, couple of other places where I have lots of friends and um, have some fun with this. Like I said, I think it's something that a lot of women will relate to. So I'm hoping they'll want to join me and, and, you know, party on celebrating this book. And yeah, and hopefully a lot of people buy it too. (laughs) Well, you have a built in audience of 10 million. Yeah. I just have, I'm not sure if those are 10 million book purchasing readers or not. So I guess we'll find out. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything left because we're, we're we've got some good stuff here. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Is there anything I you'd like me to ask you? I'm going to cut this part of it out, but um, I don't know. I mean, I think we covered it pretty well. Um, so if people want to find you online, they just go to lostinsuburbiablog.com, which has links to your books, also all of your blog posts. If they want to find you in their local newspaper or closest newspaper, how do they do that? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, one of the newspaper groups that syndicates me is Gatehouse uh, Media, Gatehouse Media News Service. And if your local newspaper is a Gatehouse newspaper, then you should, I should be in your newspaper um, or on the newspaper's website. Um, but if I don't show up in the newspaper that arrives like at the bottom of your driveway every day or once a week, then certainly you can visit me on the blog, and I always post my columns a week there after they appear in the newspapers. And I apologize if I sound a little congested. I um, My husband was sick last week, and uh, he got a man cold. You know about you know about man colds, right? Sure. You lie in bed all day and, and get your doting wife to uh, take care you of you. You know what? A man cold is much worse than the average common cold. and um, <laughs> But only men experience it this way which is why it's called the band and, and my husband was just like sick as a dog for a week. And he was, in fact, so sick that he was convinced it wasn't even a cold. He thought perhaps that he contracted Rocky Mountain spotted fever or Arctic sea, sea lion poisoning um, <laughs> because he looked on WebMD and looked up his symptoms. And uh, I kept assuring him it was just a cold and um, that, you know, without a vaccine for, you know, Arctic sea lion poisoning, he was probably going to recover in five to seven days. And he did, in fact, get better, but not before giving it to me. Um, and you know, once a man cold passes to his wife, it then becomes a mom cold and it's, um, it's not any less severe in its symptoms. It's just, there's a lot less whining involved. <laughs> well, that, and you've got, you still have the minivan to drive or the non minivan. Right, my I SUV, and I still have to run all of my errands. But, um, right. so any, any congestion you're hearing now is not a New Jersey affect. It's actually the remnants of my mom cold, former man cold. <laughs> Well, you also write for Aiming Low. Occasionally, you're on AimingLow.com. And then you also write for another blog, too, do you not? I do. I write for, I'm a comic relief writer for Aiming Low, just like you, right? 
Uh, no, I have graduated. I am now official staff writer, so wow. I, have, I, I have that over you. Oh, I'm humbled in your presence. Um, <laughs> yes, I also contribute to Huffington Post Parents, and I um, am also a blogger for The Balancing Act, um, which is a TV show on Lifetime, so I blog for their website, and um, they, um, they have actually elected me, voted me, I don't know, crowned me. Um, America's top blogger back in 2010. So I guess after they did that, they felt compelled to have me blogging for them. Um, so I do that as well. And I'm actually going to be appearing on the Balancing Act in April. I'm going to go down there and uh, tape a segment on the show with their guest celebrity host, Julie Moran, at the end, oh, at the end cool. of March. And then um, we'll, uh, it'll air in April at some point. What, what's your segment? My segment is... Um, about this book that I've written called Lost in Suburbia, A Mom Walk. Sure. How I got pregnant, lost myself, and got my cool back in the New Jersey suburbs. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, yeah. everywhere. All those, April 2nd, but you can pre-order it now. And you can do that, actually, right from the sidebar of uh, lostinsuburbiablog.com. Thank you. Thanks for noticing. Ah, you're welcome. Um, Delton, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's really fun. Oh, fun. I, ha I have to, before we do that, I have to call you... Actually, I have to call myself out. You took me to task, uh, and I just remembered this while you were talking, uh -oh. at the Aiming Low conference because we were comparing Twitter followers, and I think I had 30 or 35,000 at the time, and you had a lot less. And, but then you said, well, how are you getting your Twitter followers? And I said, well, I follow a lot of people who read blogs, <laughs> and then they follow me back. And you said, well, those aren't really followers. Those are just people who follow you back. And then we went through yours, um, and uh, and you had a lot less, but they were a lot more dedicated. And you were basically telling me to stop bragging about your Twitter account. <laughs> by the way, now I'm up to like fifty thousand, but it's still it's still. You're you're, know. be, you're being followed by like you know I don't know earwax companies and things like that. Oh my God, I'm being followed by so many people who or so many businesses who I know aren't reading my blog. Although I will say. I just I'm doing a contest right now with the Fisher Space Pen Company. You know, you remember space pens? No. What's this? Space pen? Okay. Oh, you've never they, they write upside down okay. and they're used in in the space shuttles for the zero gravity. They're they've been around forever. Um in any way, they are uh, they're fans of mine. Okay. <laughs> and so they they there was a Seinfeld episode where uh Jerry got passed along a a, a Fisher Space Pen and anyway. Anyway, so Something um, you really haven't lived until like menopausal products start following you oh you know like I, like products for um you know senior incontinence and things like that it's like really <laughs> I, I'm, I'm at that point now in my life or like little hand fans for hot flashes yeah, and things of that stuff. nature you know adult diapers that kind of thing i well i was at blogger this year and uh, you were at blogger too weren't I you was. and it was nothing but menopausal products they had they had panty liners. They had, oh, my gosh, it was everything. Well, see, this is the, the aging of our demographic here. All of the bloggers that we have known and loved now are starting to grow up, and our kids are growing up. And soon we're not going to be mommy bloggers anymore. We're going to be grandma bloggers. Right? <laughs> That's true. have a whole new generation of bloggers all writing about our grandchildren and our, <laughs> and our adult diapers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of Twitter and Facebook, um, I know they can find you on the website, which has links to everything. What is um, what do you, would you rather people follow you on Facebook or Twitter or both? Or? Well, I have a, a Lost in Suburbia fan page on Facebook. Definitely go visit me there, and you can um, see all of the latest column links, blog links, and funny little irreverent things that I happen to post during the day. Pictures of my dog from Peoria, um, and uh, so that's Lost in Suburbia fan page on Facebook. And then my Twitter handle is. Tracy in Suburbia, pretty easy to remember. Definitely find me on there, and um, I will follow you back. And that is Tracy with not an E, so just T-R-A-C-Y. T-R-A-C-Y-I-N-S-U-B-U-R-B-I-A. Okay, now you can thank me. Thank you. I really like hanging out with you on Skype. This is fun. Yeah, you're, you're – well, I always like – I've said this on other shows before, but um, – and, and it's, this is going to sound really awful to say, but the truth is there just aren't that many funny bloggers. I, I think there are a lot of people that have doses of humor in their writing, and some are funnier than others, but I just don't think there's a lot of true humor bloggers out there, and you're certainly one of them. Oh, so thank I, you. I, thank you. Well, you know, I, I 
learned um, at the Irma Bombeck Humor Writers Conference. And if anybody out there is an aspiring humor writer, I have to tell you that that is really the conference to go to. You are surrounded for three days by 350 of the funniest people um, who are all really dedicated to the, the craft of writing humor. And it is just so inspiring. Um, I started there in 2006, um, went back six years later as a success story, um, and actually uh, was on the faculty there. And it, it's been a great opportunity to do that. So thank you for that um, compliment. I appreciate that. I'm probably the only boy that grew up reading Irma Bombeck. Uh, well, I doubt that. <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, it, like I didn't even understand all the references when I was 13 or 12 when I was reading her books, but I knew that they were funny. Yeah. And she just was a great joke writer. I mean, just amazing. She's not still alive, right? She's, no, she, sadly. She died, I think, yeah. in 1996. She had kidney disease. But, yeah. um, but, you know, I mean, there are some really terrific people who are still writing who are also humor columnists, um, like Dave Barry who oh, is oh, sure. just um, actually going to be um, doing a session with him and W. Bruce Cameron, who's another fabulously funny writer. Um, they have both since retired, essentially, from column writing, and now they're focused on books and screenplays and things like that. But we're going to be doing a panel together at the National Society of Newspaper Columnists Conference in June. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've only met Dave Barry once before, and I sneezed on him, so I'm hoping he doesn't remember. Well, he's a legend, oh. so... He, he doesn't remember the little people. You got to sneeze on somebody. You should sneeze on a legend. <laughs> That's right. Well, anyway, thank you so much for being part of the show. I really appreciate it. And I'm just going to tell my audience, Tracy is a fantastic writer. I've read some of the book, and it's great as everything she writes. So go out and buy it. Support her. Okay, so say goodbye, Tracy. Goodbye, Tracy.